Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I think uh, there is a slight change. George Mendes will not be joining, and this is a fireside chat between myself and the CEO, identify Mr. Guru Geva. May I please welcome Guru on stage. I think uh, a couple of people in the audience have attended the last summit we did in the month of May and are familiar with the fireside chat format with Gur and I. So I'm just going to start posing questions at Gur, which he is very good at handling, and he will give us the right answer. In fact, just before this chat, I thought I'd start with a joke, so I asked Chat GPT to you know, kind of give me a joke about uh, biometric company, rec facial recognition. So I'll just read it out to you. At least you're honest about the source of your jokes. Everyone else is just <laughs> chat GPTing away without any accreditation. I'm no, I, I like the jokes that chat GPT gives me. Every time I'm bored, I'll just go there and say, tell me a joke. Here's a joke on facial recognition. Why did the facial recognition system feel unappreciated? Do you know? <laughs> Apparently because it couldn't find a face for all the recognition it deserved. <laughs> And for those who do not know Gur, you must know he's, he's actually a very funny person when, when it comes to his comic timing. Here's another one. Why did the facial recognition algorithm go to therapy? It couldn't stop seeing faces everywhere even its, in its dreams. <laughs> all right, so serious business. Moving on to, uh, first of all, Gur, uh, tell us what is Identify uh, and why or how did Identify come to existence? Good morning, how are you? I'm well, thank you, and yourself? Um, Identify is a biometric authentication platform. Uh, we formed about six years ago. Our modus operandi, our mission statement was to stop identity theft in Africa. Uh, we've done towards 100 million face match operations specifically in Africa. We focus traditionally on financial services, uh, government, non-bank non financial institutions, and really the focus is understanding the face or the biometric of your consumer, understanding that consumer's identity for compliance with regulation, stopping identity theft, and uh, stopping fraud. And uh, we formed a strong name in the banking community where we've learned a lot about SIM swap fraud, and as a result of the gray listing, and now uh, seeing a lot of demand in the telco space. Okay, uh, so I've, I've, I know that uh, Identify has done quite a lot when it comes to the BFSI sector, right? I think you're working with one of the largest banks here in the region. Uh, help me understand, what are the current challenges faced by mobile service providers in, in the Southern African region when it comes to data security? I think what we're seeing is that I think the, the fact of credit listing has put a lot of pressure, obviously, on the banking community from a macroeconomic perspective to stop money laundering. And when the banks are double-clicking on the risk they're seeing, they're seeing that, I think, Sabric released about half a billion rands worth of fraud in the mobile banking app space. About 90% of that is including some swap fraud somewhere along the line of that fraud. So the telco operators are coming under a lot of pressure to say, this is your piece of hardware, soon to be a piece of um, software in the form of the eSIM, but this is your piece of real estate. You need to make sure that it's secure. You need to ensure that the individual behind the SIM card is the correct individual, because otherwise we're going to be perpetuating the SIM card vulnerability in terms of the SIM swap fraud, and that pressure is coming onto the carriers now. Okay. Uh in, in continuation to SIM swap and you know uh, data security, I know that some time ago there were proposed uh, regulations by uh, ICASA that uh, regarding biometric data collection. Right now, help me understand how are these received by you know consumers and organisations? I think when ICASA came out and said we want to start binding a biometric to a SIM card. Uh, there were two major themes that we saw in the response. The one is, I think Comric said, and, and, and astutely so, said, how does this scale? How can we ensure absolute scalability of the process of binding biometrics to SIM cards? How do we ensure inclusion across all handsets, across LSMs? So a question around scalability. And then obviously from the consumer perspective is 
a traditional knee-jerk response to Big Brother, you know, Georgia or 1984, Big Brother, who's watching us now? We're going to put our biometric in yet another place, and how is our biometric inf information protected? So a lot of pushback from the consumer. I was actually interviewed on radio, and someone said to me, what do you think about this pushback? And I said, it's, I think it's a little bit ironic. When you go to... Um, retailers to banks or to mobile network operators and you perform a SIM swap, you are asked for your identity document. Yes? Yes. On that identity document, is your image on the identity document? Yes, it is. Is that a biometric? Yes, it is. Does the carrier have the ability through a bureau to retrieve the biometric image from the DHA? Yes, it does. Okay, so that's happening today. And now ICASA is wanting to formalize, standardize, and raise the level at which biometrics are handled to, st to stop SIM swap fraud, and, every and all the consumers are saying, no, but you're gonna get your biometric. And that's, that's the irony. And the importance is to de-identify that biometric. So one of the things that cybersecurity companies do is they confirm, they convert, sorry, not confirm, they convert the image on the identity document into a series of ones and zeros that are not detectable by the human eye. And those are stored and encrypted at rest and transmission. So when stuff like regulation comes in, there's a great clampdown on loose JPEG human detectable biometric images and a great increase in secure biometrically hashed um, information which is not as nearly as susceptible as to identity theft. So I think the pushback from the consumers was sensationalistic and, and uh, potentially not as educated as it should have been. Well, uh, okay, in that, uh, in continuation to the, that very question, how do you think other sub-Saharan countries or in our countries uh, within the continent approach to the issue of, uh, you know, SIM swap fraud? I think from, from our communications with a number of carriers that are pan-African, it's a, it's a, it's a pan-African problem. It's, it's not something linked uh, or limited to South Africa. You've got Mozambique in April. This past April is enforcing biometrics on SIM card registration. You've got the Communication Authority in Kenya. Um, that's been significant delays, but imposing biometric linking of the individual to the SIM card, and despite all the best efforts of the Kenyan carriers, that deadline has to be pushed out a couple of times. And then even beyond requirements and legislations, we're dealing with significant carriers in Nigeria that are actively registering biometrics to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of SIM cards a day. So that is happening. It's happening successfully, and I think it's an inevitable trend. All right, okay, now, uh, what do you think, uh, what is, identifies a key argument, that what's your key argument in combating SIM swap or identity fraud? The key argument is uh, human's ability to recognize another person's face is exponentially less accurate than a machine's ability to recognize a human's face. This wasn't the case. A few years back, it is now the case. So if I'm looking at your face and you've got a very similar looking cousin, chances are I'm going to make a mistake once every few hundred times or few thousand times. Software, the software you deploy makes a mistake uh, four in a million. So I walk into the carrier, I've obtained your identity document off the dark web, I've replaced it with my photo, I've done a photo swap. The ability of an individual on the other side of the counter to detect the identity theft is very, very low. So now you've got a SIM card bound to the wrong identity. Or in a SIM swap situation, you've got the SIM card bound to the wrong identity. I log into my app, I um, do an out-of-band confirmation, I get an OTP, that OTP doesn't come to me, SIM swap's been performed, someone access my account, and 179,000 to 180,000 rand goes missing. We had this case in South Africa um, a short while back. So... Uh, one, we need to move away from OTPs generally because they're not secure. Um, and as we say, and the Sabric is saying, 90% of banking fraud in the mobile app is linked to some sort of fraud because the in-app authentication is much more secure. And we need to be able to bind an individual's identity Something, there's something that you have, your device, something that you know, your knowledge-based questions, um, but something that you are, your biometrics to that SIM card to stop the SIM swap fraud, which is, which is hitting this country. Okay, so uh, SIM swap uh, leads to financial crime, and then, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
it's, it's of course a risk. Now help me understand, uh, what role does biometrics play in mitigating these risks? And what are the concerns regarding the implementations of biometric solutions, particularly in terms of surveillance and privacy? Yeah, we get this question a lot. Uh, face recognition, surveillance. Uh, surveillance is very different to what biometric authentication is asking. When you log into a major top five bank in South Africa, the bank asks you to do a selfie. It's a one-to-one -one communication. You're holding your own device. You're getting informed. We're about to ask you to do a selfie. Please switch on your camera, right? It's not embedded in the 400 long pages of T's and C's. You're aware about it. You know what the purpose is. It's a once-off usage. You consent. You consent again. You switch on. You switch on your camera. Sorry about that. You switch on your camera and you do a selfie. That is, that is not surveillance. Surveillance is I'm sitting here and in the corners of this room are, in theory, not not in this particular room, and are CCTV cameras and they're surveilling us. If you look towards the east, uh, you're walking in the street and you're being. Um, captured by cameras, and if your credit record isn't clear, your face appears on a massive billboard, you're named and shamed. Surveillance is as laughable as it is, as much as it sounds like a show from Black Mirror, this is what's happening. That's surveillance. It's unbeknownst to you, you haven't opted in, and some stream is recording your face, transmitting it somewhere for some purpose, you have no idea. Biometric authentication is you know you've opted in, you've decided to do it, and you're protecting your own asset. That's that's what we're doing it for. You're protecting your own assets with your knowledge. It's not surveillance, it's one-to-one -one authentication. Okay, uh, now given that uh, we have audience uh, primarily from the telecom operators around here, how can telecom... Uh, is this a telco conference? Indeed it is, but we were talking, I, we have a lot of fintechs as well, so, and plus, uh, I think so far we were talking about financial crime. Moving on to the actual question, how can telecom companies successfully implement biometric identity solutions for mobile you know, users in, in the region? Um, it's not easy, for I think, for three reasons. I think the first reason is and this is no disrespect to, to, to telcos or to banks or to insurers or to any other industry. It is difficult from the other side of the RFP questionnaire, which we're, which we're always receiving, to assess accuracy. So you guys are going to be procuring biometric systems day in, day out, and you want to know how accurate is this? How, accurately are you, how accurate are you at matching African ethnicities at scale? Someone is going to give you a NIST accredited certification. It's very difficult to understand how do I test that? Because unless you have your own massive data set of African individuals that have been taking selfies from a low-end Android device, you're not going to be able to detect that. So the most important thing is to detect accuracy. What is the false accept rate and the false reject rate of liveness, i.e. the ability to tell someone's alive on the other side of their handset, and the accuracy of the face match, that these two people are in fact the name, same person and not similar looking people. That's difficult and that's where luckily the Accentures and Similars, Deloitte's and PwC's, McKinsey's are in a position to provide independent support to say, here's a massive data set, do the testing yourselves and the science will speak to itself. So it's, it's accuracy. The second is scalability and Linked to that is accessibility, right? So I don't think this is something, what, what we said to the banks, they said, okay, six years ago, how are we going to do remote authentication for all our customers when branch uh, presence is going down, we're under overhead pressure and we want to shut these branches down? And we said, it's simple, crowdsource the hardware. The hardware is in, this, in the hands of your customer. Use the customer's hardware to authenticate the customer. So in order to achieve accessibility is enable biometric verification from the device, which is happening, of course, um, with Momo, with super apps, with retail apps, and generally that's fundamental. And to bridge the gap for those devices that are on smart, but those individual are equally important customers, of course, then we need to provide agent facilitation or some level of in-branch authentication. And then scalability. Um, it's very important for a telco, especially given the volumes that you guys run and the loads that you see and the, and the peaks and troughs, 
to be able to scale a solution. And that's when you need to dig into how many transactions per second can you handle? Uh, what are your SLAs? What are your latencies? Where do you host? All of those kind of questions to ensure that there's not only accuracy, not only accessibility, and not only scalability, because that, that'll truly solve the problem. All right, thank you so much. Uh, now, could you be able to provide with an example or a success story of like a successful biometric implementation in the telecom industry? Yeah, I think the... Unfortunately, we have to look a little bit uh, further abroad than Africa. I think that the trend is coming here. Um, we've looked at a lot of the deployments here. They have been delayed. The legislation has tried to implement them and cool off. The quality, I, I believe, and, and, no, and no offense to the industry in, in Africa, is, is not there yet. But if we look at uh, Austria, if we look at Germany, Deutsche Telekom, um, uh, Ventocom, you've got high quality, high grade, um, deployments that are onboarding people in three to five seconds and really confirming who they are. And, you know, you guys know how to un un unlock the geofencing of those kind of apps. Have a look at those. Those are incredibly high security. They're incredibly frictionless. They won't transport necessarily to the African environment because they're not going to work on a Mobi cell or a Hisense or a, or a PEP-enabled smartphone, but the principles are the same. And uh, we, we're busy, we're very busy with some large carriers at the moment, so, so keep your eyes out for, for something more local and lacquer. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Uh, but uh, just, to, just to go back to Austria, do you think the acceleration uh, of, of advancement in technology was a result of uh, acceleration in fraud? I think it was. That's a good question. I, I think it... <laughs> As long as it, it depends, there's a multiplicity of factors. I think number one is a collaboration. I think that what I, what we saw, at least with the banks, and uh, it was really interesting to see the sort of the, the personality of the telco community come out. Everybody comes out with a, with a huge level of confidence, camaraderie, and connectedness. And there are some jokes and digs, etc. But there's a lot of warmth in the room. Five years ago, when we were dealing with the banks, we said, share the information. Share the information of the risks you're seeing, the attacks you're seeing, the hacks you're seeing, because a strong neighborhood is a safer neighborhood. And the result was no. I'm building my own high walls. They can go to bank number two to penetrate. So I think what we've seen in Europe, uh, through our technology providers in Europe, is that there's a strong degree of collaboration and sharing of information. Um, and that's one of the success stories of Identify is that we have optics across Standard Bank, across Absa Bank, across Investec, and we see patterns of fraud and we see patterns of the friction and customer frustration and customer success stories. So I'd invite the carriers, I, I can see there's a high level of collab already, but I'd invite the carriers to collaborate on tech and on fraud results and even to consider recycling the KYCs and the know your customers across carriers because people are making decisions about carriers, not necessarily about how slick the KYC process is, but because of a handset or a data plan. or, or a, So there's a way that one can collaborate and recycle that data, which will make a much more powerful solution in our territory. All right. Now, uh, just before we wrap, of course, uh, the wrap, when I mean... <laughs> No, because the last time I spoke to him, he asked me to rap. So, just before we WRAP, uh, how does Identify's platform address the challenges of SwimSwap, fraud and identity theft uh, here in South Africa? What is it that Identify does differently or you know, something that uh, you, you take pride in? Um. I seeded it in very subtly uh, when I said accuracy, scalability, and accessibility. Um, and that's, that's what we do. So everything we do is externally audited. Uh, it's not about uh, beating our tests about our, uh, beating our chests about the accuracy of our own certification. We're audited by auditors that say, here is the accuracy of Identify. Here are, is evidence of their scalability. This is their ability to do B. We're, we're integrating into Shenosis. Uh, we were lucky enough to win the MTN app of the year in, in 2021. And the result of that is we're enterprise grade. So we're not 
The problem is everything looks like a selfie, a document, and a face match. It all looks the same, and a lot of vehicles look the same. Some cars have airbags, and others don't. And you're only going to find out about the airbag 2 to 3% of the time. And that's the difference with, with identify. The, the airbag is there. So not if, but when you're hacked, the airbags will deploy. And we have a continuous monitoring system for new forms of attack. So I think that that is a fundamental difference. And if you look at half a billion worth of fraud just in the mobile banking app, if you look at a 40,000 rand handset leaving a telco store because employees are sharing passwords, we know that the risks and the fraud vectors are into the billions of rands in this industry. And the quality of the solution, the enterprise grade uh, capabilities, the fact that it can be done on almost any handset in Africa, those are the differentiators. And we're not self-certified, we're externally certified. And those are kind of the things that we, that we, we help with by saying, don't ask us, ask the auditors. Well, thank you so much, uh, Guru, for those wonderfully detailed insights on, on uh, the market and uh, identify. Now, the time is uh, for questions. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Okay, I've truly uh, spoken their minds, which means I've asked all the questions they had. Or they're just completely bored, checking their email and relatively hungry for lunch. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Hi there, um, doctor here. Uh, so I have a question around um, how is Identify really looking at uh, addressing concerns around AI and deepfake uh, in the future in terms of uh, authentication? Thank you. It's, uh, it's a fundamental ongoing concern. We've been set up from the beginning with the humility that every single piece of software has an error rate. And uh, when we started the business, we only developed technology where we could define or quantify the error rate. What, di what differentiates us is that we don't just put AI on the brochure and let the neural networks run and, you know, let, I mean, as you saw from ChatGPT, ChatGPT is being used by law students to complete BCom LLBs and recently was discovered to make up case law, right? Um, so one must always prioritize PR <laughs> communication. So I'm just saying that it, the, the AI network can, can go off on a tangent. So you're writing your LLB, you go to ChatGPT, it makes, this, it makes this up case law with the correct principle, but incorrect surnames. With AI and face match recognition, you need the participation of forensic experts watching digital replay attacks, right? So we see on a monthly basis not a hundred, not a thousand, tens of thousands of attacks monthly on the system. And some of those attacks go through on a Monday but are solved on a Tuesday. And that comes from a principle of, of humility because this is a virus and vaccine industry, cybersecurity. And that's the most fundamental, is not letting the AI run amok on its own, constant monitoring and having reporting, pre-defined reporting mechanisms of what happens not if, but when you are hacked at a, thank God we've never had one since inception, but if it does happen at a material level, we have a protocol to notify employees, risk officers, customers, directors, all the way up to our own shareholders. And that is a fundamental modus operandi of constantly monitoring for attacks because they're um, improving all the time. Hi everyone, oh, yes. Uh, my name is Avashan, I'm from MTN. Uh, telcos of today kind of outsource a lot of their resources, especially you know, some of the frontline staff that have access to pretty much anything to do on a customer's account, spend limits, ad lines, SIM swaps, etc. So we outsource that resource but give them internal access. And, and when you mentioned now a, a case of where uh, identity theft happens or they share their passwords and usernames. That for me, I think, is the, the biggest problem that I face in my space right now. 
where we can't identify this, the root cause of the, the, the fraud that's happening, or in fact, find out which IP or where that, that traffic is coming through. How does identify help with the case like that? So, I mean, on 90% confidence, we can solve that for you and even structure a, a, a success reward commission, not commission, a commercial structure, because we're that confident on it. If I've seen it, you, you walk into a store, you ask for an expensive handset, a gentleman logs in and then is called because he's a subject matter expert in Samsung. So he gets pulled across, the, mach the, the, the software is open, the monitor is open, and his colleague, she moves in and finishes the transaction. And maybe she's colluding, maybe she's not, maybe he's colluding, maybe he's not, and the handset walks. And um, it's, it's not an 800 Rand handset that walks, it's the iPhone 14 Pro Max 512 gigabyte in black, the most expensive. Now, that, that's, that's a very simple thing to solve because on a 1,400 Rand Android tablet, you can have a communication protocol that says, okay, you're opening this transaction, you're facing, your face logged in. That handset goes missing and isn't activated to a customer, there's your face. Uh, what, what password, what username, I don't care. There's your face linked to this transaction in an encrypted way to protect the identity of employees. But it's a very simple solve. And as soon as that message gets out to the outsourced workforce, because I totally understand the problem. It's difficult to scale a business of yours and hire everybody. And then, but you're giving them, their, you know, talking about edge, this is the most important touch point. And once that biometric is bound to that opening of the transaction and that device goes missing, it's three, six, nine months before word gets out that, okay, people are getting summarily uh, retrenched subject to basic conditions of employment act, et cetera, from letting handsets go. And he says, well, somebody else operated. Well, your face, your responsibility to open, middle, end that transaction. Thank you. Okay, in the essence of time, this will be the last question. And should you have any questions further, uh, Guru is around. Okay, cool. Um, All right. Thanks, Captain Sita from uh, Vodacom. Um, we've had an opportunity to collaborate successfully. And I just thought about this, you know, with the wave of cyber risk, cyber security, fraud prevention, fraud detection, we all focused on, on these, these types of use cases, right? But what about balancing risk with uh, the opportunity around growth? And are we seeing more use cases where people are, are more than just pioneering and looking at how do we solve stuff for, for convenience and ultimately address opportunities of organizational growth using technology like this? Absolutely, Kirtan. So the fundamental balance, everything is, every light costs a shadow, every opportunity in cost has a benefit. It's fraud and it's friction. It's no point implementing a solution which is incredibly forensically powerful and introduces insurmountable friction. And when we started the business, we said that this process has to be snap scan speed. When everything that I've heard from, from the three leaders of the different telcos, whether it's the abstraction of the API layers and removing the legacy systems, whether it's switching on a tap and seeing the water come out, customers are not interested that you've got a human security operation center monitoring deep play, you know, deep fake attacks and managing a false accept rate of four in a million. They couldn't care. They want to log in with their face, have their asset secured and move on with their day. And the key thing to monitor is minimizing the friction and optimizing the flow through. So if we can remove, have you got your identity document at a branch? Well, you don't need it. You have your face, and 75% of faces in the DHA. You don't have your face in the DHA, we'll do a, a contactless finger capture and match it to the DHA. No problem. You don't have your ID doc. There are so many opportunities to remove what was your wife's maiden name, or what was your first car, or what was your 14th address. Was that avenue? Was that lane? Was that road? Was that crescent? No. Here's your face, good to go. Here's your device, it's yours. So it's about removing the friction while protecting the fraud. Thank you. I think uh, we'll take one last question. All right, thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, from Telcom is Wutlari here. I just have, uh, I think, two quick questions. First question is uh, from facial recognition. What is your recommended acceptance pass uh, percentage when it comes to facial rec? 
And the second question is with what your banks have done, your in-app authentication and stuff. Do you think with the mass market that we have uh, from a telco side, are our consumers ready to do something elsewhere and then they have to authenticate with their apps because majority don't even have the apps? Thanks. It's the false accept rate and the false reject rate is what you control for. So you want to make a mistake, call it four in a million, at a constrained false reject rate of one in 10,000, right? You, the reject rate is falsely rejecting an individual when it is that individual, and that causes friction, and an accept rate is letting someone through who shouldn't. So that's always the balance, and you, you constrain the false reject rate, and you shoot for, we shoot for a mistake rate of four in a million. Our, our competitors are in the 10,000s. So that, that's something that you can see by certification, and I would ask for that. The question on types of handsets and app consumption, right? So we, surprisingly, you, you know, we say we deal with the top banks, in those bank handset populations, you'll be surprised. So we, we run deep analytics, Microsoft Power BI, on the types of handsets in that population. You'll be incredibly surprised what's sitting in those handsets. It's, it's not the top-end smartphones, predominantly. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite low-end Android devices throughout, and I'd hazard a guess, I mean, we can anonymize that data. It doesn't breach uh, confidentiality that you guys are similar, sitting with similar handsets. The question about app consumption and individuals who don't even engage their app, it's, I think, a lot about SDK size. One of the things we've learned is if you provide an identity capability which is sitting at 70 megs, your conversation is over. The, 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 the trick is to provide an identity verification capability that's six megabytes and have the capability of reverse billing the data. So that's something that none of the international vendors knew about and we had to develop that. So when you download the app, we as a carrier, we as a bank are paying the data, but that's, there's a lot of technology behind that. and. What we've realized from, from the banks is, unfortunately, in this country with the level of crime, um, people are deleting the banking app at 7.30 before taking public transport and then re-downloading it after 8 p.m. when they've finished their day's work because people on the public transport are, show, are saying, show us your banking app. We're going to wipe you out. So they wipe their banking app before they even get on public transport. So I think it's about customer centricity and having deep voice of customer conversations to understand why are you not engaging our app? Is it too large? Is it clashing with your CPU memory? Are we not reverse billing the data for you? Have we imagined that you wanted a product that you don't need, to George's point? Um, those, those are the key conversations that you guys are much better positioned to have to us. We can bring some learnings from, from banking and telcos across the rest of Africa, but I'm sure you guys have a deep understanding of your customer base there. Well, thank you so much, Guru. I think, uh, should there be any more questions? Not a very subtle promotion, but identif Identify has a booth right outside. Uh, you know, you can visit the booth and, uh, or you can write to us. We will forward the questions to uh, Guru and get you the answers back. Thank you so much, Guru. Thank you for doing this again. Another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.